Good day, and thanks for joining us for our webinar on COVID-19's impact on U.S. food and agriculture. I'm Jim Minter, director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture. And joining us today are my colleagues, Dr. Jason Lusk, who's the department head and distinguished professor of agricultural economics here at Purdue, and Michael Langemeyer, who's the associate director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture and also a professor of agricultural economics as well. So the impact of COVID-19 has taken a tremendous uh, impact on U.S. food and agriculture. Let's talk about some highlights or lowlights as they were uh, with respect to the impact on the ag sector. The University of Missouri's Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute just last week came out with new estimates about the, their estimate of net farm income, and it's $20 billion lower than it was just a month earlier, uh, suggesting a huge impact on U.S. agriculture. Um, late last week, USDA indicated that they're going to provide $16 billion in direct payments to farmers and ranchers. Uh, $9.6 billion of that is targeted towards the livestock sector, $3.9 billion targeted toward the row crop sector, uh, $2.1 billion for specialty crop producers, and $500 million for other crops. The, that total package is actually about $19 or $19.5 billion, with the remainder going for purchases of food to try and uh, boost or prop up prices for agricultural commodities. Um, the mechanics of that, how this is going to work, are still a little bit unclear, but essentially it, they've indicated that producers will be compensated for 85% of the estimated price losses that occurred from January 1 through April 15th of this year, and then 30% of the estimated price losses starting in April 15th and continuing for the two subsequent quarters. And Michael, you and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, the first reaction you had to this is that the dollars might not be enough, right? I don't think so. That sounds like an awful big number, 16 billion. But if you look at that 3.9 billion for row crop producers, uh, and you're looking at compensation, 85% of the price drop, I don't think that math quite works. I think you're gonna need more money than 3.9 billion. Yeah, so there's gonna be one of two options there. It's either gonna be more money appropriated, yeah. or perhaps uh, the compensation levels might be less than the initially specified, yeah. right? Okay. So Jason, you've been taking a look at the impact on retail sales, particularly looking at the meats. Uh, let's take a look at some of that data. Yeah, I think, you know, we all saw it when we went to the grocery stores. There was this big stocking up period that started in about mid-March when the shutdown orders started going at home. People were worried about reduced mobility, and you can see it in sales data. So um, you're looking at here changes in fresh meat sales. It really increased pretty dramatically uh, through the week ending March 15th and the 22nd. You know, and really the peak there, we we're you know 100% more sales for chicken and almost the same uh, for beef and uh, uh, well for beef and a little bit lower for chicken. And uh, but anyway, I think we've moved a little bit beyond that stocking up phase, and you can see prices really starting to come back down. And we're in, entering into something. Hopefully, hopefully it's not a new normal, but it's at least an equilibrium for the next couple of weeks until we can get food away from home changed. Yeah, so if you look at those numbers, looking at the last couple of weeks, they're both in the, or all three really, in that 30 to maybe 40 percent range above where we were at the beginning of all this. Is that enough to offset the losses in the food away from home market? Uh, almost surely not. So, it, you know, it is more than usual, so about 30 percent more than last year, but you know, more than half of our food spending is away from home, about 54% of that spending is away from home. So yeah, while we're, we're moving more through the grocery store, it's probably not enough to offset what we were losing through the food away from home. And that has implications as we're gonna see for the rest of the livestock sector going forward. Yeah, there's, there's some really interesting data out there, a little bit of kind of creepy if you think about it, but these companies that are tracking uh, our movements through our cell phone use. And one of the companies here released some data on foot traffic. The top graph here is in grocery stores. Uh, so the, the, the kind of orangest line is what happened last year. The blue is, is this year. And you can, again, not only in sales, but you can see it in foot traffic data, this big spike that happened. We started visiting grocery stores a lot more often. Um, then of course the bottom graph there shows you what happened to restaurant and food away from home uh, uh, traffic and just fell through the, through the floor. And to your point, Jim, about you know one not completely offsetting the other, look at both of those lines are below where they were last year. We're just moving around a lot less. Now we may be stocking up a little more when we go to each grocery visit, but I think the, the uh, truth of the matter is there's just a lot less economic activity across the board. And as I look at that sit down restaurant chart, it's interesting, uh, it didn't go to zero. Yeah. And I think that's indicative of the fact that that's probably mostly uh, 
curbside delivery mm -hmm. type service and take home service, right? I think that's right. So yeah, there, some of them are still operating kitchens on a reduced scale. So yeah, you can go by and pick it up, but nobody's going in and sitting down. But even even still, we're still down quite quite a lot from where we were, uh, you know, even a few weeks ago. Uh, I think the effects have been, you know, really heterogeneous. We've been talking about food at home and food away from home. It's a really nice graphic of how changing of changes in spending track through our credit cards and debit cards. So you can see uh, supermarkets, uh, you know, they're, they're up a little bit, but they're kind of hovering there between positive and negative. So it probably depends on which part of the supermarket we're looking at. You know, areas of the of the economy that have really picked up a lot of spending, not surprisingly, food delivery. <laughs> um, uh, meal kits are up high. Online grocery has increased quite a lot. And uh, gaming, I can speak to that with two teenage boys in my house. Uh, they've unfortunately probably been on their computer a little more than they should have. But of course, a lot of other things have taken a hit. Uh, fast food is down probably you know 30% or so. And uh, on the very far side, airlines, movie theaters, basically you know 100% reduction almost in in uh, spending in those in those categories. Yeah, anything related to travel or. Uh uh, entertainment is really just falling off a cliff and taking a huge hit, right? That's right. You know, other than the gaming and maybe some streaming services. Uh, I think, you know, I like to look at prices. To me, you know, there's been a lot of talk about whether there's enough food to go around. Um, you know, prices, I think, are a signal of scarcity. So it's one thing I kind of watch out for to see if, if, you know, demand is sort of outpacing the supply. So these are wholesale meat prices. Uh, pork and beef um, on on your left hand side there we did see that prices move alongside that same stocking up period so that increased spike in demand people were stocking up it was pulling more meat through the system which was causing prices to increase but then again just like in the total sales data really leveled back off uh, you know I think you know chicken we saw even less pronounced there but I think the interesting thing beef pork and chicken prices now are below where they were last year so this gets to your point again Jim that the the increase in sales through grocery stores has not, you know, has not been enough to compensate for the loss in food away from home. There are, of course, some exceptions. Eggs might be one of them. Uh, really big, almost 300% increase in egg prices, uh, which is pretty dramatic. It's come down a little bit, and that's due to a variety of logistical reasons, uh, which maybe I'll touch on in a minute, uh, and some regulatory issues that don't let eggs move uh, easily from one market to another. So it's interesting that we've seen such a sharp drop off in those wholesale pork prices, but not quite as sharp a drop in the beef prices. Uh, with beef prices, as you pointed out, below a year ago, but not maybe as dramatically. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's a little counterintuitive for me because I think about uh, beef probably having a higher income elasticity. Mm -hmm. And as we lose income, I was probably expecting a little larger impact on the beef side than the pork side. Any ideas as to why we're seeing different responses in pork versus beef? It I don't have any really keen insights there. If you have them, uh, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a little bit hard. I mean, actually, for me, it was really interesting to see even a lot of the stocking out in the beef category. I thought, you know, here's a fresh product, a relatively more expensive product, and yet in the few weeks after the stocking up period occurred, the grocery stores I was visiting, the meat, the beef section was entirely stocked out. So some of it just may be demand related that consumers, this is a go-to item, especially ground beef, people can turn to at a time of, of need and panic. <laughs> Yeah, the one thing that I think about on the pork side, of course, is the, the belly prices. And so much of the belly is marketed in that food away from home category. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's the driver. And I, and I have looked at the belly prices and the ham prices, and they're both down pretty sharply. But um, it's an interesting phenomenon. Longer term, though, I, just, I guess I have some pretty serious reservations about beef prices because of that higher income elasticity. Mm -hmm. And as consumers lose income, that might have more impact down the road. Yeah. I thought I'd just, you know, really briefly mention what I think to a lot of people seems like a paradox, that on the one hand, we see em some empty grocery store aisles, so in dairy, you know, sometimes some of the milk aisles have been stocked out. At the same time, we're seeing these stories of milk being dumped. So how, how can these two things happen at once, surplus on the farm side and scarcity at the retail side? And the answer is there are people in the middle and there are processors and people that have to transform those products and get them to us. And the, the other thing that's associated with that is that the way food gets delivered to us in a restaurant setting or a food away from home setting is very different than the way we consume food at home. So dairy is a good example here. And I've got a couple of pictures. So a lot of milk goes to school cafeterias. How are those children drinking that milk? It's in little tiny cartons, uh, which is not the gallon jugs that we're accustomed to buying when we go to the grocery store. And uh, you know, on the flip side of that, uh, you know, the cheese, for example, we buy and there's a lot of pounds of milk in a single pound of cheese. 
uh, we buy maybe a half a pound bag of shredded cheese. Well, if you're a restaurant, you may be buying a 50 pound block of cheese or a 50 pound box to put on your pizza. And the plants that are designed to be, you know, that have all the capital and equipment to be producing those little jugs or the big blocks, you can't just flip a switch and have them crank out a gallon jug of milk. And so there's real, real capital asset fixity that doesn't easily uh, enable a, a processing plant to switch from one production line to another. I mentioned eggs. I'll just go back to that really quickly. In the case of eggs, you know, a lot of times those eggs are going into uh, restaurants on big pallets. So we think about the little carton of a dozen, but they're in big pallets. And then there was these regulatory issues that once it was labeled to go into a restaurant, and it was packaged that one way, they couldn't turn around and resell it because of laws that prevented that. So some of those have been pulled back, but even still, even if you're allowed to do it, you still need more cartons <laughs> to, to move those eggs. And you, know, you don't just have a bunch of empty cartons sitting around unless you need them. So the, all these like logistical issues associated with moving food and different uh, food processing channels or food distribution channels, I think has really caused some of this paradoxical kind of behavior. So we have a, a complex food delivery system and food processing system that can it can accommodate a gradual shifts, but when you try and shift the entire system mm -hmm. overnight, it becomes almost impossible. That's really what you're getting at, right? That's exactly right. And then the question is, you know, for any one of these companies, of course they can invest the million dollars to put it, you know, switch over to a gallon jug line, but is it worth doing it if this is only gonna last two more weeks? Pro yeah. Probably not. So you're in this kind of awkward situation. And in some cases, even if you do want to make the switch, it's going to take several months, perhaps, to make that investment and get yeah. it operational. So, and, and this is occurring not just in the food markets, but also elsewhere in our economy as well. So, so this gets uh, exactly to the point you, you were raising, Jim, earlier about why you know is maybe beef and pork being effectively affected differently. I thought it might be useful instead of just looking at aggregate beef or pork to pull this out into different primals. So this is beef here, and what we see is that relative price changes are really different depending on which part of the of the carcass we're looking at. Um, you know, on the beef side of things, actually really strong price increases for round and chuck. These are the areas of the animal that we mainly turn into ground meat. So increased demand for ground meat, also something we can easily move from, you know, food away from home to food at home. But by contrast, the loin is taken a hit. So this more expensive steaks uh, and, and short plates, also think of skirt steaks that get mainly served through restaurants. So we're seeing picking up some combination of both demand issues and then where these products normally go in our food supply chain. The next one is the same story, but for pork, and this gets exactly to your point. You can see belly prices really falling through the floor uh, right when this crisis started started taking hold. And I think that's a clear signal that we were eating a lot of our bacon away from home. Um, maybe it's in those breakfast uh, restaurants or what have you. They've started to recover here a little bit. Uh, again, here loins for pork has, have been you know, a little uh, fared fairly well, and that may be that you know a pork chop is just cheap, cheaper than a ribeye. And as people's incomes have taken a hit, maybe they've sort of substituted away from those. Um, so I think it is interesting to look at these individual components, not like an across-the-board story. I, I think one thing I'm really keeping my eye out on, really, since uh, a lot of these um, you know, concerns started taking hold, is what's happening in the meat packing sector. And I think the reason I think this is important important sector to look at is that a uh, you know, big proportion of our meat processing is concentrated in a handful of processing plants that have a lot of workers. This works well when times are good because it is, we have really high, you know, large economies of scale that can affordably process meat for food consumers. But in this time, it's, you know, if you get one or two or three or four of these plants shut down, it could be, have some real big impact. So, this uh, map here is one I created um, based on, on some data that, that suggests that about 15 of, your, of the largest pork packing plants in this country process about 60% of all hogs. And I just drew a little uh, circle around, roughly around Iowa. 10 of those, or 11 of those 15 are in that circle. So pretty concentrated. And any one of those dots is anywhere from about two to you know, four or 5% of our nation's uh, processing capacity. So I think, you know, watching what's happening in that sector, especially over the last week, as some of those plants have been brought offline, really big one in South Dakota, where now 500 some odd workers have been uh, ill from that plant. And that plant was about, you know, about 4% of our nation's processing capacity. 
So, you know, we can stay in one or two of those, but you start getting three or four, that's, you know, could start having some really detrimental impacts, uh, particularly for, on the farm side of the market. And there could also be some locational issues. You know, as you look at that map, uh, in particular, there's a very large Smithfield plant in North Carolina. Uh, there's a relatively large seaboard plant mm -hmm. located uh, near Guymon, Oklahoma. Um, those plants serve a portion of the industry that's not well situated to move hogs to another part of the country. Mm -hmm. And that could create some additional issues in, dis in addition to just the capacity issue. I think you're exactly right. I mean, I guess one of the good things about all those dots being within relatively close, close proximity is if one of them goes down, you can either switch over to, to another. I should point out the two we have here near us. Um, so far, I think, uh, you know, one the Tyson plant closed down for a day, but still seems like it's longer term plans are okay. Um, Indiana Packers seems to be okay at the moment, but, you know, these are things to really keep an eye on, I think. It's, it's going to be a concern for an extended period of time. Yes, uh, uh, no doubt. Um, so rather than just looking at capacity, we might just look at slaughter numbers, how many animals are moving through all of these plants. On the beef side of things, uh, the red is this year compared to the dotted line, which was last year. And you, you can see it in the data that some of the plant shutdowns we've seen and slowdowns, not just shutting down. Sometimes you're trying to spread out workers like we're a little spread out here. Uh, you can't run as many animals through there. And you can see a really big hit in terms of processing. Uh, pork is, uh, you know, a little bit less. So there's a big dip there uh, that happened. Uh, some of that may have been associated with uh, the plant shutdown that I mentioned in South Dakota. Some of it could have been Easter uh, as well. So that, that is that is the, uh, you know, the the time period around that Easter holiday. So that is part of the drop off. But either way, we see we see even though we had really high animal numbers coming into this, we're below where we were last year. Yeah, and I think the other thing to remember there is you look at these numbers. And think about it, uh, when you see these reductions in, in slaughter capacity or sl slaughter operations, those animals are still out there. Mm -hmm. They still need to be processed. And one of the challenges going forward is, are we simply kind of delaying the marketing of some of those animals? Or are they continuing to gain weight? I know historically in the beef industry, that's always been an issue when we have these, some of these slowdowns, whether or not we're simply delaying marketing, wind up marketing cattle, for example, a little later mm -hmm. at heavier weights and actually boosting beef production and giving us an even bigger price response on the negative side. And this so, is gonna be very worrisome for the pork industry because we were expecting rather large uh, pork numbers uh, later this year. And so any backing up of animals is, is really gonna have an impact. And it, that would especially be true if that extends into the fourth quarter because yes. that's when the industry was per, potentially looking at a capacity problem in terms of processing. So, um, well, let's just take a look at the prices for live animals. So these are slaughter steer prices in the Southern Plains, and you can see that blue line, which is the 2020 line. And as Jason was indicating earlier, at the beginning of the year, we were basically even with a year ago, um, were expectations for larger production numbers, larger supply numbers. So there was an expectation of some weaker prices, but you can see the collapse, especially the last two or three weeks. Uh, feeder cattle prices, similar story, sharp declines in those feeder prices. You look at hogs, uh, maybe a little sharper decline in percentage terms um, as and related, I think, in part to the packing plant issues that you were talking about, Jason. So those base hog prices down 20% just the last two weeks. And then perhaps the most severe decline is on some of those baby pigs that are uh, normally moving into a, a, grow a growing operation and then later into a finishing operation. And the decline in those prices started earlier in the year, and part of that was related to what Michael was talking about, this expectation that we were already looking at large pork supplies, especially in the latter part of the year, especially after the summer was over into the fourth quarter. And then that got exacerbated by what's taken place recently. And so, you know, we're approaching the point where those, uh, those early wean pig prices are going to get down to the point where... Uh, people might almost literally be giving those yes. away because of the re negative returns that the, they're looking at potentially. Well, I think this, this speaks back to Michael's point too that, you know, uh, you know, when are these pigs going to hit the market? You know, it's down the road and, yeah. you know, in a few months. And so the prices we're seeing here are a reflection of the problems people are anticipating two or three months from now. Yeah, very much so. So a little summary slide here, Michael, that I think you pulled from the University of Missouri's uh, Food and Ag Policy Institute. This is from the report that came out last week, but it kind of summarizes the change in their perspective over just one month. And maybe you want to walk and us through that. And this is for the entire, entire year. 
uh, some of the price declines you were showing uh, showing in, in the recent slides there, the previous slides, were larger percent drops in here, but this is for the entire year. And, and just look at some of these percentages, down 11.5% in terms of steer prices, 9% uh, nine, nine, nine for, for uh, barrels and gilts, and 9% and for milk. So just some very large uh, de declines in prices here in one month, essentially. Uh, going from the baseline, which released in, in early March, to uh, to this this new analysis uh, called COVID uh, in, in mid-April. So just extremely large declines. And for two of those sectors, particularly the pork sector and the milk sector, this is really a shock because uh, if you think about the pork sector, uh, the talk for an extended period of time now has been about the possibility of seeing a boost in exports uh, mm -hmm. to China to take advantage of the fact that they were having a shortfall in pork production because of African swine fever. Uh, so this is really kind of a kick in the teeth for the pork industry with, with respect to a change in expectations. And the same thing on milk. I mean, I think we were expecting a, a rebound uh, in profitability in the milk sector. Um, this really takes that away and, and makes both of those sectors And for steers, for example, we were looking at close to break even level uh, for the second quarter of, of 2020. That break even it now has turned into losses uh, in excess of $250 a head, mm -hmm. closer to $300 a head in, 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 in April. Yeah, so I, maybe our wrap up comment here is a lot of discussion about what does this mean with respect to feed demand. In the short run, I don't expect a big impact on feed demand because the animals are still out there. But these kind of price changes do suggest smaller livestock production, smaller uh, feed consumption going forward. Not so much here in 2020, but as you think about feed demand for the 2020 crop and that 2020 marketing year, which starts in September, uh, it does have an impact with respect to feed demand down the road. So there are some concerns on the consumption side for feed producers, not just on the livestock uh, producer side as well. Let's shift gears, Michael and take a look at budgeted returns for corn and soybeans. And you spent a lot of time here last week trying to figure out where we're at in terms of profitability. So let's take a look uh, at those budget turn, comparisons. Things have really turned south for corn. Uh, looking at the January budget numbers, things, things, this looked like almost a turnaround year for corn. Uh, you know, corn profit has not been very good since 2014. At, at 2020, it would actually look, didn't look too bad. Uh, what a change that what a change has that that has occurred here. Uh, looking at the recent estimates, and, and a lot of this has occurred uh, in the last two to three weeks. Uh, corn prices have really tumbled. Uh, here I'm reflecting a, a drop in corn prices of I think 50, 55 cents a bushel, uh, and so resulting in a drop in crop revenue of 116 dollars. Just an unbelievable, um, unbelievably big drop in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, of course, the way the Art County PLC program works. Uh, here I'm assuming PLC for corn. Uh, we do get an increase in government payments, but it's not near big enough to offset that drop in crop revenue. Uh, very little difference in, in variable cost. Uh, you know, fertilizer prices have changed a little bit, but most of the costs are, are very similar uh, looking at the recent budget compared to January. And so the bottom line here, uh, looking at contribution margin, return over variable cost, we're looking at a drop of, of uh, a net, re net return of, of close to $80 per acre. So for our viewers, remind us what contribution margin means. Essentially what we do here is we take the, the crop revenue uh, plus the uh, government payment revenue and we subtract variable cost. Okay, and down. And so what's left? Uh, land, uh, machinery, ownership costs, and labor. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to that a little later. Let's look at the same kind of analysis for soybeans. It's, it's quite different for soybeans, even though we've seen a, a drop in soybean prices. It, it's, it's closer to five, six percent, uh, you know, where corn is, is at least double that, uh, quite a bit. Uh, quite a bit higher than double, actually, uh, depending on what time frame you look at there. But just looking at these budgets, a drop in crop revenue of $43, that, that is rather large. Uh, but but to, to some extent, that's offset by a, a higher ARC County, uh, Arc County payment uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, and so the bottom line here, the contribution margin uh, it only dropped $4 uh, for soybeans uh, compared to the $78 uh, for corn. And, and uh, it, it, just, it just seems like yesterday we did that webinar uh, related to the March 1 um, you know, crop, crop planting intentions, and certainly corn has really changed since we've done that webinar. Beans a little less so um, in terms of negativity, but corn has really changed because of that drop uh, in corn prices. We'll get in why uh, corn prices are so weak right now. I would like to discuss that footnote uh, in passing here. Uh, we are using estimated Art County PLC payments. Uh, these are based on base acres. 
Uh, and so we're assuming the Art County PLC payment is the same for corn and soybeans because it, remember the Art County PLC is, is not based on what you plant, it's, 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 it's based on your base acres. Yeah, good point. And uh, we'll come, there's a reason why we wanted to talk about these budgets first because it has some implications for the outlook because we think there's going to be an acreage shift yes. relative to what the planning intentions. We'll come back to that here in a few minutes. I would like to continue this a little bit further and just look at net farm income. Uh, and so this is gross revenue minus cash expenses uh, and depreciation. It does exclude operator and family labor and opportunity costs of machinery ownership and land. Uh, a little bit later, I'll be talking about net return to land. The uh, net return to land does include some opportunity costs uh, associated with machinery ownership and labor. And so, uh, and so I want to make sure everybody understands what we're trying to do here in the next two or three slides. So looking at net farm income for a West Central Indiana case farm, uh, just north of, of Tippecanoe here. And uh, this just puts into perspective uh, what 2020 looks like compared to, to recent years. Uh, obviously, returns have been down since 2014, uh, but just just shows you how ugly things look right now uh, for 2020. Uh, that little triangle there is my estimate of net farm income uh, for this case farm. That's lower than 2015 when we had that very wet June uh, and the yield was very low because of that. Uh, we do get an Art County PLC payment. That's the checkered bar. Uh, in, in all of the uh, uh, charts here, but if, if you look in 2020, there is a there is a payment there, but that's rather small compared to the MFP payments uh, that occurred in 2018 and 2019. But uh, uh, just not a very uh, uh, optimistic outlook right here. And as you pointed out a minute ago, that's significantly different than what you were projecting just three weeks ago. Definitely, I mean, it, it's 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 at least fifty sixty dollars lower. Because uh, when you take eighty dollars out of corn, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, you're going to you're going to get quite a bit lower in terms of your net farm income estimate. All right, let's just look at the difference in earnings per acre versus corn versus now, beans. When I was do, when I was covering this uh, slide uh, during my meetings this winter, I, I was saying that it's 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 a coin toss uh, in terms of whether you plant corn and soybeans. In terms of the profitability, it looks like very it looked like very similar profitability uh, for corn and soybeans. A very very big shift. Uh, compared to what what we what occurred from 2013 to 2018, where we still had a lot of demand for soybeans, particularly from China, um, and, uh, and things have really turned south for, for corn, uh, as I indicated on, on a previous slide. Uh, and here we're looking at some pretty significant advantage to soybeans, uh, around $75, uh, not quite as big as what we saw in 16, 17, and 18, uh, but it is quite different than what we saw just a, uh, just a month ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking at this a little bit more, uh, we usually uh, cover these in our webinars related to uh, uh, the market outlook, and so let's uh, let, let's let's cover these again. Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to look at relative costs and relative yields uh, for corn and soybeans. In this case, uh, it's rotation soybeans versus continuous corn, and and we're trying to, to trying to answer the question. Uh, if soybeans, for example, is eight dollars, a little bit higher than that right now. If you take futures and adjust for basis, but let's use eight dollars. Uh, corn would have to be uh, on high productivity soil, 368 or above, uh, for us to produce continuous corn. Uh, this is using Purdue budgets. This would look a little different in Iowa. I always throw out that caveat, but nevertheless, here uh, in the Eastern Corn Belt, we're probably not going to see a lot of continuous corn based on these numbers. I think very little continuous <laughs> corn, especially now, right? Yeah. Uh, looking at uh, uh, soybeans, continuous soybeans versus rotation corn. And so this is ground that had soybeans uh, so with soybeans last year. Uh, so we're looking at second year soybeans versus rotation corn. Uh, let's look at $8 soybean price again. Uh, corn price would have to be 336 or above. That's a little higher uh, than what the, 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 what the uh, uh, price estimate would be looking at the futures uh, and adjusted, adjusted for basis. But having said that, uh, actually soybeans have looked better uh, in, in, in particularly 16, 17, and 18 than what this table uh, is suggesting. So I'm still anticipating uh, about 50% soybeans and 50% corn in Indiana. Okay. Um, this chart uh, here is, is, is taking a close look at those net returns uh, from, from our Purdue budgets and trying to, trying to uh, figure out what that means in terms of net return to land. And so if you look at 2020 there, we've got an estimated net return to land. Again, this covers all costs except for land costs of only $90 per acre. That doesn't cover much cash rent, uh, needless to say. 
but that, that the key point here is that's way below uh, the current cash rent uh, uh, estimate for 2020 of $241. Something has to give. Uh, when you have uh, $25 to $50 below cash rent, uh, you can say, well, people are thinking that things are going to look a little better next year and the year after. And so there's not quite as much pressure to negotiate those cash rents. You start looking at $100 to $150 uh, lower net return compared to cash rent. There's a lot of incentive to negotiate cash rent. Now, this is without any of the, of the COVID payments that we've talked about er on an earlier slide. This does include Arc County uh, for soybeans and PLC for corn, but it does not include those, those COVID payments. But nevertheless, that $150 uh, uh, difference there between cash rent and net return to land, in my mind, means we're going to have some uh, we're going to have significant downward pressure on cash rents this fall. Yeah, and to put that in perspective, you can go back and look at 2015 yes. when that difference was about roughly 160 or so dollars an acre between the two. We dropped forty dollars. We dropped at forty dollars, yeah. and this time we're about 150 dollars apart. So. Yeah. Uh, I guess that neither one of us may be ready to forecast exactly yeah. what the change is going to be, but we, we know the direction and it's certainly going to be some difficult yeah. conversations. Another thing I, I, I will also point out, if you, if you look at uh, uh, inflation adjusted cash rent going back to 96, so going back further than this uh, chart, uh, you're looking at a, 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 a real cash rent uh, for West Central Indiana of about 210 to $220. And so unless there's some reason to think that net return to land down the road is going to be higher than that long run average, uh, that also suggests that we're going to have some downward pressure in cash rent. So there's just a lot of negatives right now uh, looking at cash rent. We're not going to talk specifically about land. Uh, land may not necessarily follow uh, the exact trend of cash rent because uh, land has some different factors uh, that play. Uh, one of the, the factors playing for land is the return in the stock market's not real good, so institutional investors may show more interest in farmland. Now that's on the margin, of course. I mean, they're, they're not the major buyer by any stretch of the imagination, but nevertheless, on the margin, that could make a difference. And also, I think you're seeing some pretty thin markets right now for land, and to the extent that continues, if there's not financial stress, uh, you know, to, to, to forcing land on the market, if that if, they, if if that doesn't happen, that also would tend to keep land prices is up. Another factor uh, in favor for land prices is the very very low interest rates. And it doesn't look like that's going to go away yeah. anytime in the short run. And so, so I'm not quite as negative, not near as negative, I should say, on land values as I am on cash rents. Yeah, good point. All right, so that kind of brings us to the question, what, were you, what will U.S. farmers plant in the spring of 2020? And, of course, USDA tried to address that with their planning attention survey, which was dated March 1 with data collected tail end of February and the first part of March. But things have changed a lot since then. So... USDA was estimating uh, corn acreage at about 97 million acres, um, but we think weakening returns for corn, as you just outlined pretty, pretty uh, in detail there, Michael, suggest an acreage shift is likely. Um, we think planted corn acreage could easily fall a million acres below the intentions. It might even be more than that. Uh, we haven't any experience with this kind of a shock to the system at this time of year. And I think that's important to remember when you think about people have already made plans, they've already laid in supplies. Um, there's some rigidity there in terms of making some adjustments, but nevertheless, we think we're going to be uh, see a shift. And in our budgets, we simply in balance sheets, we simply move that million acres over to soybeans. So the expectation a million acres less of corn than what USDA was forecasting based on the planning attention survey, a million more acres on the soybean side. Um, so. What are the implications of that? If you have trend yields, well, we're going to see some pretty big increases in ending stocks at the end of the 2020 marketing year, and that is especially true for corn. Um, let's just look at the numbers a little bit here. So here's an estimate of corn production. I've got the 19 estimate from USDA. There's still just a little bit of uncertainty about that number. I think USDA is talking about doing a resurvey in May and some of the northern Corn Belt states. So that number could change a little bit for 19. but uh, if you take that 96 million acres of corn, plug in a trend line yield of about 177 bushels per acre, you wind up with record corn production of 15.6 billion bushels. Now, we should say there that that assumes normal prevent plant. 
So yes. going back to more of a normal situation with that plant. Yeah, that's a good point. I held I held the harvested acreage as a percentage of planted acreage at the average of the last Which five years. Which is a very years. good assumption. Yeah, uh, right excluding now, last year, yeah, I should say. We do need to throw that out. Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm assuming a lot of normality here, I guess. It's kind of <laughs> a good way to put that. Because uh, everything's normal. Yeah, exactly, right exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the demand side in the corn sector. And, you know, obviously the, one of the drivers has been the downward pressure on ethanol values coming from weak prices for oil and in turn unleaded gasoline. This is a chart of uh, monthly average uh, unleaded gas prices versus ethanol rack prices based on the Omaha market. Um, and so if you look at what's taken place there, they've both taken a nosedive, right? And so that downward trend in ethanol values is really starting to hurt corn demand. Um, if you look at ethanol plant margins based on some data from Iowa State University, they published daily estimates of the ethanol plant margins. So this is just return over their operating cost or return over their variable cost on a dollars per gallon uh, basis. Um, you can see the red lines on there, right? So we've dipped into the red here starting in early March and, and I think at the end of last week bounced back uh, and maybe got a little bit positive, but nevertheless, those negative margins, when you can't cover your operating cost, Michael, I think you used to teach production economics. What's that mean? Uh, when you can't cover your operating costs, you're probably going to shut down or at least slow down. Yeah. And I think some of the estimates suggest that uh, in recent days, the industry is probably operating in the ballpark of 50 to maybe 60 percent capacity. Uh, some, some variability there with respect to how many of those plants are actually shut down versus operating at reduced levels. But nevertheless, a lot less corn moving through those ethanol plants than, than what would have been the case otherwise. Um, so if one of our colleagues here, a, a research associate professor in the department, Farzad and I did some work looking at some scenarios here recently. And the estimates really are all over the map in terms of how much of a reduction in corn de uh, demand you might actually see coming about from this. So we looked at three different scenarios. And really what they get at is this idea that not only do we have an impact with respect to loss of corn demand here in the short run uh, because of what we just saw in that slide with respect to those negative operating margins, but even after we start to kind of get, bring the economy back online, we're not likely to see a, an immediate rebound. We're going to be in a recessionary environment for an extended period of time, and that's going to take its toll in terms of uh, fuel demand and ultimately eth ethanol demand. So um, we looked at three scenarios, and we estimated those reductions between, in round numbers, about $350 million, uh, 350 million bushels and as much as 640 million bushels for the 2019 crop year. And that's probably a bigger reduction in estimate uh, in, in ethanol usage than than most people are looking at. I think USDA on their most recent uh, WASDE tables, the most recent supply demand tables, uh, had a reduction in the 2019 crop year that was pretty close to that 350 million. Uh, I think there's a significant risk of it being larger than that. So bottom line, what's that mean? Larger ending stocks at the end of 2019 and lower prices, not only this year, but carrying over into the 2020 year. And then, of course, that weak ethanol demand is pressuring corn basis here in Indiana. We have benefited greatly from strong demand for corn for livestock feed and for ethanol. And you can see in that chart, this is from our crop basis tool that we have on the Center for Commercial Agriculture's website. Uh, Nathan Thompson on our faculty maintains this portion of the site. And he just updated this with, uh, he updates every Friday. So if you look at that uh, black line, that's what's taken place here in the 2019 marketing year, the 2020 uh, here in March and April. And notice how that basis has just collapsed as ethanol demand has evaporated. Uh, and we're below the average, below the three-year average now. And of course, we had been well above that three-year average uh, for an ex really this entire marketing year. And I don't see that recovering anytime soon, right? I, I think that's going to continue to be uh, either at or maybe below that average going forward. So in addition to the losses on the futures market, we've had that additional loss here in the eastern Corn Belt especially. Um, so on the soybean side, if you take uh, the acreage, uh, bump that acreage up a million acres above what USDA's estimate is, so this is about 84.5 million acres. Uh, trend line yield, which is just almost but not quite 50 bushels to the acre, that gives us a soybean production estimate of 4.1 billion bushels pushes us up above that 4 billion bushel mark um, and gives us the big carryover that, that we were trying to work our way through. So here's USDA's ending stocks estimates for the uh, up through the 2019 crop marketing year. So they're projecting that we'd carry over 
20 per, uh, excuse me, 12 percent of soybean supplies um, and 15 percent on the corn side. However, if you think about that ethanol scenario that I was just painting for you, I think there's a risk that those ending stocks at the end of the 2019 marketing year will actually be larger than what USDA is projecting, perhaps up in that 17, 18 percent. 19 percent would be a really large reduction in, in ethanol demand, but 17 percent is very possible. So even larger uh, carryover stocks maybe than what USDA is suggesting. And then as you kind of carry that forward, and I had to make a lot of assumptions here with respect to demand for the 2020 crop, but we could see a big boost in those carryover stocks. And, uh, you know, Michael, you and I and, and, and Jason were talking about this before, this before the webinar started. You could debate whether or not that 29% carryover on corn is correct, but it's going to be a big number. Uh, whether it's yeah. 29, maybe it's 28%, maybe it's 27%. Yeah. It's a carryover level that we haven't seen since the late 1980s. And we've got to remember, when you look at 16, 17, I uh, wasn't corn, U.S. corn price is about 335 with 15% carryover. And so you guys think, what, what are they going to be with 29% carryover? Yeah, so that's, that's a scary number, I think, from, from the industry's perspective and one that we certainly were not anticipating just a few weeks ago. And on the soybean side, we reduced, we reduced acreage 13 13, 14 million acres and got that 23% that down to 12%. Now we're back up to 18%. So even the soybeans is, looks a little scary here. Yeah. So let's look at the price scenarios a little bit. So here's, uh, um, again, from the University of Missouri's Food and Ag Policy Institute uh, on corn. This is for the 29, excuse me, these are the uh, 2021 crop yes. year prices. So they had corn at 370. They've now dropped that down to 335. So about 10% lower than what they were going in. Um, I personally think that might be optimistic. I if think that, so too. If that carryover number that we just projected is, is in the ballpark, I think 335 could be optimistic. Uh, soybeans, they've got going from 885 to 827, so about a 7% decline in soybean price. Um, I think that's probably pretty realistic at this point. And then on the wheat side, they've got that coming down about 5%. So pretty big shocks on the price side. And I think the risk is if we see those trend line yields, and I'm in, in the ballpark on those acreage estimates, um, we could see even a larger reduction, especially on the corn side. So let's kind of wrap things up and uh, kind of think about where we're at and, and what the impacts of all this are. So Jason, I'm going to start on the consumer side with you. Sure. I'll, I'll maybe just start by putting a little different spin on those really high stock numbers. Probably the single uh, most common question I've been asked by media over the last two weeks is, are we going to have enough food? So you see, at least see some of those inventories out there. You think, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's out there. Uh, can we get it yeah. to people? Is it in the form we want? May, maybe not. But th it's those kind of numbers I've often referred to that we do store and bring forward a lot of food, uh, particularly some of our commodity grains. Um, so at least on the consumer side, bad for farmers, but at least on the consumer side, the, the fact that we have some stores is, is, is something that's, that, that consumers find comforting. I think looking out to the future, um, I think we've got to look at recessionary impacts here and in general. Uh, when we have lower incomes, uh, that tends to have an effect, you've already mentioned it, on meat demand. Tends, meat demand tends to be pretty income sensitive. The other one is food away from home. Um, yeah. You can look back to the, the last uh, Great Recession and we saw um, food at home stayed kind of pretty flat, but spending on food away from home fell. Of course, now we're already spending less on food away from home but just because of the COVID concerns. But even if we, you know, tomorrow got back you know, that we got, you know, we could open up the economy, we could all go out again. Um, we're not likely to eat out as much just simply because our incomes may not support it like we did. So I think uh, slower recovery on food away from home, um, stronger demand for, for sales through, rest, through uh, grocery stores, but probably not enough to compensate for the loss we're seeing uh, both from income and from food away from home. And then lastly, I think just, you know, it's not a it's not a panic time, but I just think something to keep an eye on is what's happening in the meat processing sector. And hopefully we can keep the plants up and running. Hopefully they can, they've already been implementing strategies to try to keep their workers safe. Uh, but I think, you know, you start to get two or three, four plants closing at the same time, that starts putting a really big strain on the system. We're not there yet, fortunately, and hopefully we can stay out of that problem. And there's really two issues there, right? One is getting food to retail markets, for example, which I think is what on the mm -hmm. consumer side people worry about. 
On the producer side, if we lose that processing capacity, it has a very negative impact on live animal prices mm -hmm. because of the difficulty in moving those animals either to a different processing plant or in some cases there just might be a capacity constraint, right? So that's, oh, that's exactly right. And it, and it's, I think, frustrating for a lot of producers because they see this margin increasing. The prices consumers are paying goes up because there's not as much meat on the market, but also prices farmers are facing are falling because there's not as much demand at the at the packing level. So, it, you know, it's it's a, uh, you know, I think the problems for producers are are, are pretty darn acute. And um, you know, we we have a well designed system to move those animals through the process until it doesn't work, <laughs> and then and then it. it starts putting an enormous strain on the system. Yeah, this is just a huge shock on the system, and mm -hmm. the system isn't designed to accommodate a huge shock. Um, so on the corn side, corn production could set a record. Uh, we kind of walked through the acreage estimate and, and really just trend line yields, which assumes the implicitly normal weather. Um, ethanol demand is going to remain weak. Uh, you could debate the magnitude of the weakness, and we looked at three different scenarios. Um, I'm leaning towards probably the middle scenario, which is kind of in between those two extremes that we pointed out earlier, but still it's a big reduction in ethanol demand. And I think importantly, it's very unlikely to see that just go away uh, because that worldwide re recession here, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere around the world is going to ha have an impact. Um, then on, on the export side, I think there's a question mark there too, and, and Jason kind of alluded to it with respect to meat demand. The issue there is what happens to meat demand, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, corn mm -hmm. that gets exported, soybean meal that gets exported, to some extent soybeans that get exported, are really all about providing more meat to consumers around the world. And as incomes weaken because of employment issues and related issues to that, uh, it suggests a weak meat demand environment, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. And that could be reflected in some softer export values for both corn and soybeans. And, you know, we're looking at the possibility of, of a huge carryover from the 2020 crop into the 2021 marketing year. Um, that could be the largest since the late 1980s. I say could because it's not, it's not guaranteed that that's going to happen. But if we see the acreage we're talking about, if we see the yields we're talking about, uh, that risk is definitely out there. On the soybean side, it looks like production is likely to go back above 4 billion bushels. I had it at about 4.1. Uh, export demand is going to be a huge factor for soybeans, but it's very uncertain, partly because of the trade situation with China. Um, one of our colleagues in the, in the Purdue Ag Econ report uh, was looking at the export side for soybeans, and uh, Mindy Mallory pointed out that there's a lot of issues with respect to whether or not Brazil is going to have some difficulties uh, meeting their export uh, uh, expectations, in part because of the possibility that COVID-19 could impede their ability to do so. So there's just a lot of uncertainty on the export side. Uh, but again, that worldwide recession uh, could hurt demand for exports on soybeans as well. So that's a little bit soft as well. And then, Michael, you've looked closely at those net return yeah, prospects. Yeah, before I get to the net returns, let me talk a little about, about the low net farm income first. Net farm income is used to repay uh, term debt. Uh, so to make payments on machinery and land specifically, and, but also to buy machinery. And so when net farm income is really low, like it looks like it's going to be in 2020, what do you, what do you typically do? Well, you look at your working capital. You see, do I have the working capital to make payments on my debt and to, and to, and to uh, purchase assets? Well, working capital has been going down very sharply since 2014. So uh, we're just going to have more farms in a situation uh, where, where their back is up against the wall where their working capital is just very low with a low net farm income, and they're not going to have a lot of, lot of wiggle room uh, to repay debt and certainly to, to buy assets. And so, and so that's what we're looking at from a net farm income standpoint. Uh, this relatively low uh, crop, crop net returns in particular. Uh, I, I'm focusing on corn here because uh, corn looks look very bleak right now. It's going to put downward pressure on cash rent uh, like we talked about earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm much more negative on cash rent than I am land values for the reasons we discussed. Uh, the low interest rate, uh, very thin land market, maybe maybe perhaps some more interest from institutional investors is going to keep land values higher uh, relative to cash rents. It doesn't mean there's not downward pressure on land values, but there's less downward pressure on land values than there is for cash rent. So Michael, those net farm income numbers, I think you mentioned before, those don't include these new payments that are coming online. No, they do yeah. not. And so yeah. and, and so that, that's, that's, a, that's what we'll talk about perhaps in the next webinar. <laughs> right. uh, how do these COVID payments impact 
uh, those net farm income but, numbers. But if I heard you right earlier, yeah. it, it'll help, but not yeah. help enough to offset the losses. It just losses, depends on probably. what that figure yeah. is for cro for crop yeah. producers. They again, the sixteen billion sounds really large, but the four billion going to crops is not that large compared to the MFP mm -hmm. payments in eighteen and nineteen. And so that's why I'm I'm, I'm very worried there that it's not going to help. It's not going to help as much mm -hmm. as those MFP payments did in eighteen nineteen because uh, let's face it, without those MFP payments in eighteen nineteen, we'd have had a lot more downward pressure mm -hmm. on cash rents and land values. One of the reasons why cash rents have been very fairly even uh, across the Corn Belt is those MFP payments. And that also points out just how heavily dependent the crop sector has become on government payments, uh, especially eight, starting in 18, especially mm -hmm. 19, and now in 20, yeah. right? That's become a yeah. huge component of uh, farm income uh, on the crop side, and, and without that, we would see a probably very negative impact on both cash rents and land yeah. values. I could never hit a curveball, but I'll use a baseball analogy here. So that's what that's what I why I'm using this this curveball analogy. We were throwing the curveball with a, the, the the trade situation with China, and now it's a second curveball uh, with the COVID, and so mm -hmm. and two curveballs in a row. And uh, we and need we've a, had trouble hitting either one. I know we need a different pitcher than China, apparently. Yes. <laughs> So with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, our next webinar will be on May 15th. Uh, we'll have an updated crop outlook and probably take a look at the livestock sector as well in that, in that webinar. Uh, so you can register for that at, at purdue.ag slash webinar. Um, and that'll always give you the opportunity to figure out what's taking place with respect to new programs coming from the Center for Commercial Agriculture. So with that, on behalf of my colleagues and the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I wanna thank you for joining us today.